my case is autobiographical, public school kid uh, flunking out of school, and an art teacher saved my life. His name was Frank Ross. He, uh, I was walking down the corridor of the high school and the art room doors open. The guy makes this great big old pot. It was magical. I'd never seen it before. I'm standing at the art room door. He turns around and says, can I help you? I said, what is that, man? He says, that's clay. I said, I want you to teach me how to do that. He says, well, get your homeroom teacher to sign a piece of paper that says you can come here and you're good to go. So for the remaining two years of high school, I cut all my classes and I went to the art room, but I was smart enough to give the teachers whose classes I was cutting the pottery I made, and they gave me passing grades and that's how I got out of the place. And Frank says, you're too smart to die. I don't want it on my conscience. I'm leaving this school and I'm not gonna let you get shot down the street like your buddies. You're going to college. So he kind of hounded me until I filled out a college application in pencil, mainly to get him off my back. I sent it into the University of Pittsburgh. They sent me a letter that says, you gotta pass something called the Scholastic Aptitude Test to get in here, which I'd never seen before. So I take the test, I promptly flunk the test, I get in on probation. But I'm very pleased to tell you not only did I graduate from the place with honors, I'm now a trustee of the University of Pittsburgh. Um, <laughs> And I was the commencement speaker. And I got up in front of 13,000 people and said, uh, don't give up on the poor kids, they might end up being the commencement speaker. <laughs> I also won something called a MacArthur Fellowship. And in my class was Stephen Hawking, who did pretty good in the physics business. So here's the inner city kid who gets into the university on probation, who wins the MacArthur Fellowship. Don't judge the book by the cover. Everybody is born into this world as an asset, not a liability. And so, <laughs> Mr. Ross took me to see a very famous house that a fellow named Frank Lloyd Wright built called Falling Water. Mr. Wright did pretty good in the architecture business. And I was so taken with the idea of this house, I decided before I leave the planet, I'm gonna build a Frank Lloyd Wright building. And I did, and I'll show it to you, because I hired one of his students. And I built it in the worst neighborhood in Pittsburgh with the highest crime rate deliberately because one of the worst things about being poor is what it does to your spirit. Poor people never have a nice day. Most of the time they don't even notice that the sun comes up because they stop looking at it. But we tried to reverse that in Pittsburgh and we built this center. That's my idea of a training center for poor people. If you guys come to Pittsburgh and you're all invited, <clears throat> you'll fly into Greater Pittsburgh International Airport. My building was a scale model for Pittsburgh Airport. But it's in the toughest neighborhood in Pittsburgh with the highest crime rate, and in 26 years of operation, no drugs, no alcohol, no police calls, no racial incidents. We have no metal detector, no bars in the windows, and we've never had one incident in 26 years. Not a screwdriver has been lost. That's the uh, entrance to the building. We have fabulous artwork wherever your eye turns. It's all my taste. Uh, well, because I raised all the money. I said to my board, when y'all raise the money, we'll put your taste on the wall. But we have quilts and clay and calligraphy and everywhere your eye turns, there's something beautiful looking back at you, including sunlight. The building is flooded with sunlight, which means by definition, it's very hopeful. Mommy's quotes and calligraphy and clay. That's our boardroom. I commissioned the Japanese cabinet maker to do 60 pieces of furniture for our school. Hired the guy from Kyoto, Japan. He came to the city and his wife said, my husband's a woodworker, I understand you were a carpentry program, which we were back then. I was wanting to give him a job. I said, well, bring the guy over, I'll talk to him. Well, he didn't speak any English. And you can imagine how much Japanese I speak but I found out he had studied with George Nakashima, who's one of the great Japanese American woodworkers, and I was hip to Nakashima. I said, well, tell your husband I'm gonna give him a job teaching carpentry, and he stood up and he bowed, and he said, please tell Mr. Strickland I'm so grateful for the job, but I apologize that my English is so poor. I said, well, tell your husband that the students he's gonna work with don't speak English either, so they ought to get along fine. <laughs> and I hired the guy and worked out all right, and we got 60 pieces out of it for our school, 
and we spun him off into his own business. He has a year waiting list doing furniture for rich people in Pittsburgh. But we got this out of it for our school. Why? Because the kids deserve to go to a place where there's beautiful furniture every day. We even have fresh flowers in the building every day, not plastic. I don't want to offend anybody's sensibilities, but I'm not promoting plastic flowers. I have never figured out the aesthetic contribution of plastic flowers to the world, but I don't have them in my school. Now that I'm getting to be a big shot, speaking at the TED conference and this and that, we had a bunch of high school principals come visit my school and they said, man, Mr. Strickland, this place is fabulous. We were really blown away by them flowers. How did them flowers get there? I said, well, I got him a card and went out to the greenhouse and I bought them and I brought them back and I put them there. You don't need a task force or a study group to buy flowers for your kids. The children deserve fresh flowers in their life. The cost is incidental, but the gesture is very significant. The reason why I won the MacArthur is I figured out the cure for spiritual cancer. It's called sunlight and flowers and food and hope and celebration, and you can cure cancer. <clears throat> we built a million dollar culinary program courtesy of the Heinz Ketchup Company, which I hope you eat. And if you do, eat more of it. I don't know where your politics are about ketchup, but I stand with ketchup. Uh, Senator Hines, who was the heir to the Hines ketchup fortune, built us a million dollar kitchen to take poor folks and give them a chance to have dignity in their life and good food to go with it. And it's worked out pretty good. We built an amphitheater. Paul Prudhomme helped us design this thing. And we take poor people with no background in food, and they're doing gourmet food preparations in 10 months with no background in food preparation. There's our pastry department, one of our students. Uh, these are some of our culinary folks. And this is what poor people are doing after six months in a black neighborhood with a high crime rate, but not in my center. People are a function of expectations. World-class expectations and world-class environments create world-class people. Prisons create prisoners. This is what welfare mothers are doing after six months. The people who supposedly have no ability and no hope. That's all pastry. I actually sat down and ate one in baskets one time. It was very good. <laughs> this is our dining room. Looks like your average high school cafeteria in your hometown, right? Well, this is our concept of how to treat kids and poor people and welfare mothers and people who have been robbed of dignity, never given a chance to stand up and be treated as if they have value. Well, there they are and they're doing fine. We also train pharmaceutical techs for the pharmacy industry. We train chemical technicians for the chemical industry. As God is my witness, you come to Pittsburgh, I'll show you welfare moms doing analytical chemistry using logarithmic calculators in 12 months with no background in science. And they're now working for Bayer and Calgon Carbon and Alcoa and PPG and Fisher Scientific. There's nothing wrong with these folks that affection and sunlight and hope can't cure. <clears throat> it's our chemistry student. We've made a fascinating discovery that you can quote me on. The only thing that we can determine that's wrong with poor people is they don't have any money, which is a curable condition. It's all in the way you think about people that drives performance. This is the arts program. Remember, I'm the black guy from the 60s making pottery in the streets? Well, I'm still doing it on a much bigger level. And I took the clay program and I expanded it, and we now work with 300 kids who are at risk. Most of them won't graduate from high school on the basis of about 50%. Well, I graduated 95% of them last year. Why? Because there's nothing wrong with the kids. The school system's the problem. The kids are fine. You have to believe in these children, let them know that they have value, give them enough clay and enthusiasm, you can cure what's troubling them. And I happen to be a believer in public education but we've got to form a partnership and surround the schools to allow them to do what they were designed to do in the first place, which is to make these children exemplary human beings. And if I'm able to do it with no degree in education, there's no excuse why we're living this way. This is all kids' work, by the way, all the kids with no talent. We did a mosaic project with the kids. This is one of the pieces they did. And this is the piece they did for the school. These are all the inner city kids that everybody's throwing away. Well, we've made a fascinating discovery. These children are fine. There's nothing wrong with them. 
but it's the environment and the expectations that drive performance every day of the week. We do photography. The kid who took that picture is now working for Disney. This is the, this is the gallery. This is the kid show. This is our idea of how to market the work of inner city kids. Before I got real fancy with my little PowerPoint, I had, actually had slides in the old days with duct tape on the corner and a slide projector. And I got called out to a place called the Silicon Valley. So I showed up with my slide projector and these people looked at me like I was from Pluto, man. But that's cool, I blew off the dust, plugged in my little slide projector, told my story. The lady come out of the audience, she said, man, what a story. My only criticism is your computers are getting a little bit old. Well, ain't no high tech guy, the old fuck saying to me. I said, well, what do you do for a living? She said, oh, I help run a company called Hewlett Packard. I said, well, my dear, there's an instantaneous solution to this problem. <laughs> and, and long and short, we've got a million bucks from HP and the systems engineer to go with it. But I keep this slide in here for nostalgia reasons, and you never know when an Apple representative might be in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> this is what HP built. This is called a classroom. This is how you're supposed to treat your kids. I also built a music hall, and a fellow named Dizzy Gillespie showed up, pretty good trumpet player. And I said, why would you come to a black school in the middle of the inner city that doesn't even have a reputation in music? He said, Billy Taylor told me a black guy built it, and I didn't believe one seat for myself. <laughs> and you ought to build one of these centers in every city in America, and I'm gonna help you do it. So he allowed us to record the concert, he gave us the rights to the music. And then Herbie Hancock showed up, and Pat Metheny showed up, and Nancy Wilson, and Shirley Horn, and Betty Carter, and Paquita de Rivera. 600 recordings later, four Grammys. Uh, we also have been nominated for two more Grammys in the Latin jazz category. In two more weeks, we may have six Grammys for a center that's in a black neighborhood with a high crime rate, which ought to let you know that we can stop this conversation and get this thing on the right street and solve this problem. There's some of the people, there's Dizzy. That's Billy Taylor and Jerry Mulligan. That's Pat Metheny and Jim Hall. Their album made the top 10. Uh, Paul Simon's engineers came down from Canada and designed this acoustically perfect recording studio. Nancy Wilson, back-to-back -back Grammys with us. These are children from the public school who come over to listen to music. This was burned out during the riots. I had another box built to hit the streets again built a 60,000 square foot medical tech building in the highest crime rate neighborhood in Pittsburgh. The thing makes money. I get downtown rental rates in the black neighborhood. So now we've got an economic development strategy that's working out pretty good. And we've never had one incident in that building either. University of Pittsburgh Medical Center is one of our partners. Citizens Bank's in there. Oh, and we also built a greenhouse. We grow orchids. I have the welfare moms growing orchids because it's good for their spirits and it's part of the cure for cancer. We sell the orchids in the grocery stores, generate money, so everything I'm showing you today is free. There's no tuition for this school. And one of the welfare mothers said, God bless you, man. I got my dignity back. I said, well, how'd you get your dignity back? She said, when I went on a field trip to Canada, the customs agent called me ma'am for the first time in my memory. And so we now know that orchids and human dignity are directly connected. This is the product we're growing. And we took first and second prize in the Orchid Symposium. And now I'm down to the end of the talk. And this is where the story takes another interesting turn. I was out there at the Silicon Valley with my little slideshow. This young man come out of the audience, he said, wow, what a story. I said, cool, man, what do you do for a living? He said, oh, I built a company called eBay. So oh, that's cool, you got a card? Remember, I ain't the techie guy, I didn't know what eBay was. So I went back to Pittsburgh and asked one of the little techie kids, I said, what is eBay? He said, oh, Mr. Strickland, that's the Electronic Commerce Network. I said, holy smokes, I met the guy that built the company. So I called him up. I said, Mr. Skull, I've come to have a much deeper appreciation <laughs> of, of who you are, man. He said, I thought you'd figure it out sooner or later. And through his foundation, he gave us a half a million bucks, and we built our first center. And now we're starting to build centers all over the country. We've got Cleveland open, Cincy's open, Grand Rapids is open, and Frisco's open. This is the one in San Francisco before it was fixed up. There's Jeff Skull on the right, Billy Wong, kids doing digital imaging. This is the work that these children are doing. These are all the kids who have no ability, remember. This is uh, Cincinnati, cut the dropout rate to 
in 24 months. And I don't live in Cincinnati, I live in Pittsburgh. It's the value proposition. There's the space, there's the kids' work, digital imaging. They turn this into a business. They're doing murals at $10,000 a mural in Cincinnati. This is the one that's in Grand Rapids. Got the dropout rate to 5% in Grand Rapids in 36 months. There's nothing wrong with these children that affection and sunlight and dignity can't cure. There's the space. These are photographs of Dr. King taken during the last two years of his life because we wanted these children to know who this man was. There's the space. These are the kids' work. And these are some of the children. And these people used to be called welfare mothers. They're now called pharmaceutical technicians. They're out of poverty and they ain't coming back. And this is the one we just opened up in Cleveland. We have a waiting list too deep. We've been open eight months. There are the kids. We saw kids get off the bus for the first time and walk away from the building thinking they got off at the wrong stop. They couldn't comprehend that this beautiful space was for them. So we got that problem figured out. And this is the medical tech program. And this is the one we're going to open in New Haven. And this is the one we're going to open in Boston. And these, those two centers. And Austin and Buffalo and Brockway are in feasibility. And Reno and Richmond, St. Petersburg, Allentown, Atlanta, Virgin Islands, and Chicago, by the way. We're going to build one here. <clears throat> Halifax, Vancouver, Northern Israel. I have a book out called Make the Impossible Possible. Buy the book. It's big type, it's real short. <laughs> but every time I sell a book, it creates the opportunity to build a center. And now let me tell you why I'm really doing this. Because Jeff Skull, Mr. eBay said, I think you're eBay on the social side. I think you're scalable. So the goal was to build 200 centers, 100 in the US, 100 around, around the world yesterday. We can change the destiny of our country, for sure. And all these liabilities called poor people can be converted into assets. What is required is hope, celebration, and the spirit of creativity that's in this room right now. And thank you for listening to what I had to say tonight. Thank you.